Hey there and welcome to DIY Projects with Pete. Today we're going to build some concrete countertops for our outdoor patio and I'm here today with my buddy Chris and uh, Chris this is your first time working with concrete right? What do you yeah, think? It is, it is. You know it was a, a process that before I you know knew that you did this it, it would have been very intimidating to even take on as a, a thought to be able to do myself but you kind of walked me through each step and kind of showed me that it's really not that many steps and it's actually a lot of fun to do. Yeah, a lot of blast doing it. I think we learned some, yeah. right? And so we're gonna walk through all the steps today. If you enjoy the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Let's go ahead and get started. We started by taking measurements and making templates for the outdoor kitchen countertops. Templates are helpful to ensure the molds are laid out correctly. And I used quarter inch thick by two inch wide strips of plywood that I ripped on a table saw and then used a hot glue gun to attach the pieces to form the template. For this project, we're going to notch out the corner sections near the grill to get a perfect fit. It's helpful to label the sides and the sections for the kitchen countertops. We did about a one inch overhang on the front side. The next step is to build the molds that the concrete will be poured in. I like to use melamine, which is basically plywood coated with a smooth white and waterproof finish. The concrete's going to form against this surface, so you'll get a perfectly flat counter. Transfer your measurements and check to make sure things match up with the template. Remember that when you pour concrete countertops using the reverse cast technique, you'll have to build the molds in a mirrored fashion since the countertops are being poured with the top surface facing down and it's going to be flipped right side up once it's cured. Use a table saw or a circular saw to cut the base pieces of the mold. And I used a jigsaw to cut out the notches around the grill area. Here's the small section that will go behind the grill. Continue working on each side of the countertop. Here are the sections that will go to the left and right of the grill. Make sure you adjust the widths accordingly so there's room to slide the pieces into place. I left a small gap between the grill area and the concrete to help it slide in easily and so it wasn't directly touching the grill. Next, cut the side strips using a table saw. The countertops being built in today's video are going to be two inches thick. So the side strips will be cut an additional three quarters of an inch to accommodate for the base of the mold. So the total width is going to be two and three quarters inches. The side strips will be cut down in length using a miter saw. Most cuts will be cut at 90 degree angles, but I did a few 45 degree angle cuts for the notched out portions of the countertops. Continue cutting down the side strips for each mold. For a basic rectangle, two side strips will be cut to the exact length of the mold, and the other two will be cut one and a half inches longer than the base of the mold to overlap the side strips. Attach the side strips to the base piece using one and five eighths inch long drywall screws. Always pre-drill prior to putting in a screw, and apply downward pressure to both the base piece and the side strip while connecting them to ensure they're flush against the work surface. Hold the drill level so the screws go straight in the center of the base piece. Have a carpenter square handy to check that the sidewalls and mold are at 90 degree angles. Here's a look at the largest mold for the project. I like to have the side strips close to the edge of the work surface while attaching them so you have room for the drill and so you can hold it as level as possible. After drilling pilot holes, I use a screw about every six to eight inches. For larger countertops, I'd recommend adding a screw at each corner to connect the sidewalls. Use a square and adjust the sidewall slightly if it isn't exactly at 90 degrees. Once assembled, double check that your templates match up. Next, we'll work on the reinforcement for the concrete. For today's project, I'm using square mesh, which is commonly used in sidewalks. Cut the reinforcement using a bolt cutter and leave about an inch gap on all sides between the reinforcement and the sidewalls. If the mold is 20 inches by 20 inches, you'd cut the reinforcement to 18 inches by 18 inches, so there's a gap around the entire perimeter. I was running a little low on reinforcement, so I attached a couple pieces together to form the last section. My buddy Chris stopped over the next morning to help out with the project. We started the day by using a vacuum to remove dust from the molds, and I used some rubbing alcohol to wipe them clean. Next, we waxed the molds to help the concrete release from the molds easier once cured. This isn't 100% necessary, but it is helpful, especially for smaller slabs of concrete, which sometimes are hard to pull away. A car wax or a paste wax works really well. Simply apply and then buff using a rag. You'll want to seal the edges of the mold using 100% silicone. Black is a good color because it's easy to see when you're cleaning up the excess. The silicone will create a nice, round, beveled edge for your concrete counter. 
In a lot of my other videos, I've taped everything off and then applied silicone. However, a couple folks reached out suggesting using a ball bearing or a cake fondant tool for this process. So that's what we're using today. This actually worked really great. It's much faster and it gives a much better rounded edge than taping. You can either make your own round over tools by gluing a ball bearing to a bolt or you can simply order cake fondant tools on Amazon and you can find all the links in the description and in the tutorial on DIYPete.com. I wanted to do an up close demonstration of the process. Simply run a bead of silicone around all sides and up each corner. Then select the bearing size you want to use and then pull the tool down the edge and up the corner. After each pull, wipe the bearing clean with a paper towel. Now the excess silicone will get pulled to each side and the two outside channels will be separated. After going around all sides, I like to dip the bearing in water and to go over each edge a time or two to clean it up and to make sure there are three distinct channels. Once complete, let the silicone cure for a couple hours. Now when it has dried, you'll be able to simply pull away the two outer channels to leave you with a perfect beveled edge. A razor blade will help with the process. Hold the razor blade at a slight angle and slowly pull away the silicone. Do this on all sides and corners. You'll wanna check the rest of the mold to make sure all the excess silicone is removed. You can use your finger or a rag to lightly scrub away any excess silicone. We grabbed a tarp to protect the work surface and then rolled out the molds. We removed excess silicone from the remaining molds and did a final wipe down with rubbing alcohol. Next, we moved on to the concrete pouring process. For this project, we're using Quickcrete 5000, which is a pre-mixed bag. It's about $6 a bag and it works really well. In fact, I have a concrete table I built four years ago that's been outside year round in the mountains of Montana and it's held up fantastic. You can check out the concrete table with LED lights video and plans by clicking on the link in the description. We used a plastic mixing tub and a mason hoe to mix up the concrete. Always wear a respirator when mixing concrete so you don't breathe in the dust. We mixed about one and a half to two bags at a time, and you'll want to mix it according to the manufacturer's instructions. You don't want it to be too dry or too wet. Now, I try to mix the concrete to about an oatmeal-like consistency. You can add small amounts of water as needed, or if it's too wet, simply add a bit more concrete mix. Take your time to make sure the concrete gets mixed up well, and it is a bit of a workout, so take the day off from your exercise routine if you're tackling this project. Transfer the concrete to the mold in a bucket, pour the concrete, and begin spreading it around the mold. Wear rubber gloves whenever working with concrete, and you'll wanna push the concrete into the edges and into the corners. You'll wanna cover the entire base of the mold with concrete, and you know we'll aim to fill the mold a little more than half full before adding any reinforcement. Now throughout the process, we'll be vibrating the concrete. We'll be using all manual techniques to vibrate the table today, so you don't have to go out and buy expensive concrete vibrating tables or tools. But if you do have those tools already, then by all means use them. I've found that lifting the work surface up and down quickly does a really good job getting the air pockets out of the concrete. Spend a few minutes doing this a couple times throughout the pour. And you can use a rubber mallet or a tool that vibrates to get the air pockets out along the side walls. Now, a lot of folks like to use an orbital sander or a reciprocating saw without a blade to vibrate the sides. I've found a rubber mallet works quite well, though, so that's all we're going to use today. Put the reinforcement in place and get it to rest as flat as possible. You can bend the wire a bit if you need to in order to help it lay flat. And then mix more concrete and start filling up the rest of the mold. You'll want to make sure you use your fingers along all the side walls to blend the second pour in with the first pour so it doesn't look like two separate pours. Then tap the side walls a few times to keep removing air pockets. I don't really shake the table after the reinforcement has been added. This kind of helps prevent shadowing issues from the reinforcement in the concrete. We'll use a straight board to screed the concrete and make it level. Move the board back and forth in a saw-like motion. Then fill the low spots as needed and then put any excess back into the bucket. I typically go back and forth along the entire mold a couple times. Then go ahead and trowel the concrete to smooth it out. Now, if you were going to do pour in place counters or concrete counters poured right side up, I'd recommend using a magnesium float to bring the cream to the surface, but this is just the underside, so hitting it with a basic trowel will be sufficient. You can go ahead and tap the side a few more times. You'll see bubbles rise and pop, which means more air voids are being removed. 
Next, we'll pour the remaining sections of the countertops. Now, these are all poured using the same technique, so I'm not going to go too in-depth with these. But the basic steps are to fill each mold a little more than halfway, vibrate, add reinforcement, screed, and trowel. Spend the extra time to tap the sides so you have as few avoids as possible. Now Chris is adding reinforcement to other sections right here. We use some spare hog wire mesh for the small section, which is another great reinforcement material for concrete counters. And always get the material to lay flat, so bend it a bit if you need to. Once the reinforcement is in place, you'll want to fill the molds and then screed them to level out the surface. We put all the molds back on the table and then rolled it back into the shop. Now this work surface is great for building concrete projects because of its large size and because you can roll it in and out of the garage. So if you're interested in building something similar, you can find the rolling workbench video and plans in the description. Now, a lot of people will do one troweling and then cover it with plastic and let it dry, which is just fine. But I always like to think of it as a good time to practice my hard troweling skills. And plus, I like the underside to be very smooth. So I'll trowel it two or three times at various consistencies. I'll let the concrete set up over the next few hours after the initial troweling. And then I'll push into the concrete with my finger. And when it barely leaves an imprint, I'll do the final troweling. Now the hard troweling technique will give it a smooth and good looking finish. It's fun to practice this technique in case you plan to do pour and place counters in the future as hard troweling does take some practice and I'm still working to improve my skills as well. Now once they set up a bit more, you can cover the slabs with a sheet of plastic to help them cure evenly. All right, once this is finished, take a break and relax a bit. Job well done. Let the concrete cure for at least 48 hours before removing the sidewalls. When ready, remove the screws from the sidewalls and slowly pull them away from the concrete. Work around the concrete and remove one side at a time. Sometimes you'll need to pry the sidewalls a little bit to get them to pop off, use a flat screwdriver or a chisel to pry between the boards. Only pry against the wood and never against the concrete. At this point, I like to hydrate the concrete by lightly misting it with water to help it continue to cure nicely. Now onto the large slab. Slowly pull off the sides of the mold and then examine the concrete. There were very few air voids in the sides and so I was really happy with how they turned out. Let them cure a while longer and then lightly sand to remove the sharp edges. Remember that concrete curing times will vary quite a bit depending on temperature, humidity, the mix used and how it's mixed, so you'll need to flip the counters when you feel they're cured and ready. When they are good to go, put a few towels under the edge, rotate the slab up vertically, and then slowly bring the concrete down onto foam or wood blocks. Once flipped, you can pull the top off the concrete and it should remove fairly easily. One of my favorite parts of the process is removing the base piece of the mold to see how that surface looks for the first time. I'm usually a bit nervous before it does happen, but as long as you take your time to vibrate the concrete as best as possible, and if you take your time with the silicone, you should have pretty nice looking concrete tops. It's hard to get them all out, but if you have a few more voids than you'd like, it's okay, and we'll be able to fill them in a later step. Once the concrete's completely out of the mold, we'll let it air dry and continue to build up its strength before sanding or polishing. I usually like to wait about a day before I sand to let the PSI or the strength of the concrete continue to build a bit. Again, this depends on the mix used and a number of variables, but it typically works pretty well if you're using an orbital sander to finish it uh, by waiting about a day. For today's counters, we'll be using an orbital sander to give them a nice finish. Another option is to use a wet polisher, which I actually used for my indoor kitchen counter project. Wet polishers are used by many professionals, and they're great if you want to expose the aggregate in the concrete, or if you want to embed things like fossils or glass. However, if you want a real natural concrete finish look, I've actually found that a basic orbital sander does an amazing job, plus the process is much quicker, easier, cleaner and more foolproof in my opinion. 
Wet polishing is a little more time consuming and it makes more of a mess. Um, but you'll want to do your research and do what's best fit for your project. You can check out my kitchen counter video, which is linked to in the description. After sanding the top with 220 grit sandpaper, flip the concrete and do the underside. I use 120 or 220 grit sandpaper on the bottom and do a quick sanding, especially along the front edge overhang where someone might run their fingers. You'll go through a few sanding pads for this project, so buy at least a 10 to 20 pack of pads to get you through the build. Wipe away the dust, and since the concrete is upside down, I like to go ahead and add a couple coats of sealer to the bottom at this time. That way it's sealed up and it will minimize the number of times we need to flip the counters. Try not to get any of the sealer on the sides yet. Let the sealer dry and then flip the concrete right side up. Now sanding will open voids and expose pinholes, so we'll want to fill in as many of the voids and pinholes as we can. To do this, mix up Portland cement with some acrylic fortifier. Now if you don't have acrylic fortifier, water can be used, but the fortifier will help the paste bond better to the concrete and in the voids. If you have larger voids, you can mix a little sand into the cement paste to give it some more structure. Now, Fortifier is in the concrete section at most hardware stores, and then the slurry mixture you create should be a toothpaste-like consistency. I usually apply the slurry mixture using my hands and a plastic putty knife. Once the slurry mixture is on the concrete, move your fingers in a circular motion to push the concrete into the voids. The mixture dries pretty quickly, so you can remove some of the excess by rubbing the concrete with your hand or by scraping it with the plastic putty knife. Now the rest of the excess will be removed with the sander in a later step. The slurry will fill in the voids and any other blemishes or marks you might have in the concrete. So run the slurry around the corners and the edges to fill areas as needed and then do the top surface. There are going to be quite a few pinholes so do your best to get the paste into as many as you can. Then remove as much excess as possible and let the concrete dry before sanding again. I usually wait about uh, 30 minutes to an hour to sand. It dries pretty quickly. Start sanding with 220 or 320 grit sandpaper to remove the excess slurry. You'll need to sand the top and all side surfaces to remove the haze. Now if you expose additional pinholes, you can do another round of slurry if you feel it's needed, but generally one or two rounds is plenty. If you do find voids later, you can simply fill in the voids and then use a blue damp scotch pad to remove excess. Once the sanding's done, use a damp sponge or a rag to remove dust. Dampening the surface will also help to see if you missed any of the slurry paste, which you'll want to make sure is completely off before using the sealer. So take the time to double check that all the paste is off so the counters have a great looking finish. Do a final wipe down prior to sealing. Move the counters inside or out of the sun and then apply the sealer. I used a water-based acrylic sealer for this project called Tough Duck Concrete Sealer that I found on Amazon. I applied about three to four thin coats of this product using a clean microfiber rag. It immediately gives the concrete a nice smooth looking and finished look and it dries fairly quickly so you don't need to wait very long between coats. Here's a look at the second coat going on the concrete. This particular sealer gives the concrete a little shine and it slightly darkens the actual color to give it a more rich finish. This is the final coat going on. You can see that the concrete now has a much more finished appearance and that it has a little more shine to it. Once the final coat is on, let it dry according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Next, I'd highly recommend applying a concrete counter wax. The wax gives the concrete another level of protection from spills and stains. You basically apply it just like you're waxing a car with either a buffing pad or a rag. Once it's applied, buff the wax with a new rag and you're good to go. The wax is also going to give the concrete a super smooth finish with almost a velvety feel and liquids will instantly beat up when they hit the surface which is pretty cool. The next step was to load up the countertops and take them over to my friend's home for installation. I laid out a bunch of moving blankets and towels in the trailer, put the concrete countertops in them and then wrapped everything to protect the edges. We used a dolly to unload the countertops at the home. Two inch thick concrete counters weigh around 22 pounds per square foot, so really any device with wheels will make your life a lot easier while moving them. We dry fit the countertops first to check that everything fit correctly. Next we applied silicone around the top frame of the outdoor kitchen, which will hold the concrete in place and prevent it from shifting. We slid the first slab into place which went between the reclaimed wood and the grill. 
We repeated the process and put the slab in the right side of the grill. They both fit perfectly and taking the extra time to build the templates was definitely worth it. The smaller slab fit perfectly between the other two slabs behind the grill, like a puzzle. We lifted the last slab onto the frame and then slowly slid it into place. Once the slabs were in, we checked to make sure they were level. We shimmed the front right corner just a little bit since the frame was slightly low. The beer test. You put it on there, make sure it doesn't slide off, and we're good. For this outdoor kitchen project, we filled the seams using 100% silicone. I mixed some white with black to get a gray color to try and match the concrete, and we taped each seam with painter's tape and then filled the seams with silicone. Now you'll notice the ends of the short piece of concrete do not have beveled edges, and neither do the rear sides of the left and right grill pieces. We specifically didn't put silicone in the mold in those areas so the concrete would be at a perfect 90 degree angle and butt up flush with each piece. This minimizes the size of the seam. We thought clear silicone might look just as good, so we decided to use it for a few of the other seams and between the slab and reclaimed wood counter. Chris grabbed some barn wood from the garage and used it to trim out the space and to act as a backsplash. Some new yard tools made quick work of the cleanup, and then we installed a bracket and hung the TV so their family can watch football and other sports at the new outdoor kitchen. And that's all there is to it. I hope this concrete countertop tutorial inspires you to get out and build something out of concrete. If you found the video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks again for watching and cheers from Montana.